There we go. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Um, and yes, as Mike said, I've been around the board for a while now. If you are a regular at the meetings, you're probably sick of hearing me by now. Um, but yeah, tonight um, we're going to be talking about the results of last year's Embrace a Stream effort and um, some of the uh, the future actions and, and the next steps that we're about to take with the project. So just a little bit of background on the Embrace a Stream project. Um, so in 2018, um, GBTU did an evaluation of the different watersheds in our greater Boston chapter area. Um, and basically looked at what cold water resources existed um, and weighed sort of our options of what we want to designate as our home waters, which is really the water bodies that we focus a lot of our restoration work um, on. And in 2018, GBTU named the Neponset River watershed its home waters because of all of the um, the cold water resources that are concentrated in the watershed. The Neponset's really unique in the Boston watersheds. Um, Ch Charles Mystic um, being the other main uh, Boston watersheds because it has a, a fairly high concentration of cold water resources or trout streams. Um, and some of those trout streams like Trap Hole Brook in particular um, are home to very large reproducing, naturally reproducing populations of brookies. Um, so it's really kind of a special place and, and that's why we chose um, that watershed to be our home waters. Um, and shortly thereafter, we thought it would be a good idea to really um, evaluate our new home waters and get to know sort of what's going on in the watershed with the trout and to also understand what sorts of restoration actions are needed to um, bring back and protect those populations. And so that was sort of the impetus for this Embrace a Stream grant to really get a baseline evaluation of our new home waters and um, to, to figure out a roadmap of future actions. And so at that point, um, we partnered with the Neponset River Watershed Association. At the time I was working with the Neponset River Watershed Association um, as their environmental scientist. So I was working with Bill and Ellen and Gabby. If you guys have been around, you've probably met them um, to put together the plan for the Embrace the Stream grant. Um, 2020, we finally launched the grant or uh, the project. And um, right off of the bat, we were planning to do stuff spring 2020. Um, don't really need to explain what happened. COVID-19 basically disrupted a lot of that. Um, and so we were delayed in the starting of the project, unfortunately, but we were able to, to sort of regroup and figure out ways to do a lot of the project components in a safe, socially distanced um, way to collect a lot of the data. So we weren't completely, um, the year wasn't a complete loss and we were actually able to get a lot uh, accomplished last year, all things considered. And um, tonight is really kind of talking about what those results were and what we found in that evaluation. Now we're in 2021, we're starting the second year. So that spring sampling that was planned for last year is going to happen this year. Um, and then we're also launching some other uh, efforts that Jenny's gonna talk about really in more detail. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, this whole project um, came about not as sort of a, a single one-off thing, but really sort of the base that we're building all of our future partnership actions, all of our future restoration actions off of, um, really looking at the data to prioritize and identify um, future restoration needs. Now I've gone too far. So um, first off, I wanna thank all of the volunteers and donors that made this possible. So um, if any of you donated, we had over 65 donors um, contribute over $5,000 towards this project, which helped draw in a lot of prize funds and additional funding sources. Um, uh, 
to more than $20,000 to pay for this. And even more valuable than that is the time that people have given to the project. So if I left your name off this list, I'm very sorry. I kind of threw this together last minute going through some of my past email lists. Um, but yeah, well over 20 people volunteered, got involved and um, helped make this project possible. So I just wanna say thank you to, to all of the, the volunteers because we literally could not have done this without your, your efforts. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the project goals was to really kind of assess the condition of our home water trout streams um, we wanted to really understand how the trout were using each stream seasonally, where they are found. We wanted to identify what sorts of problems exist in the watershed um, and then develop plans to address each of those problems and, and prioritize you know, which problems to tackle first. We evaluated three main stressors in the watershed. So the first is habitat fragmentation. Um, basically, are there barriers in each of these streams that are preventing fish from getting to where they need to go? There's two sort of main types of barriers that we think of. One uh, is dams. So dams obviously um, create sort of like a one-way traffic on a stream. A fish can go downstream over a dam but they can't really go back upstream. And that causes a lot of issues um, when it comes time for spawning or um, stream sections get too hot and they need to find more optimal habitat that can create a big issue for them. Um, the other main types of barriers that exist in the watershed uh, are undersized or poorly designed culverts or road crossings. You might have heard of a perched culvert where the pipe that's carrying the stream under a road, the bottom of the pipe is actually above the stream bed. So it creates like a small waterfall that fish can't get through. Or sometimes if the, the pipe is too small, it creates um, artificial uh, increase in stream velocity to the point where fish have a hard time swimming against that current to get up through there. Um, so we went through and evaluated the the fragment or the sort the barriers that exist in the watershed in each of these streams. In addition to that, we wa uh, monitored water temperature. So as you may know, uh, trout, brook trout in particular, are very sensitive to warming of water. They really need cold, well oxygenated water. So we uh, monitored water temperature in a, in thirty plus locations throughout the watershed um, to get a sense of um, where water conditions and temperature conditions were staying cold enough for trout and wet areas were getting too hot. And then the final thing we were looking at is uh, seasonal habitat utilization, which isn't really a stressor, but I threw it in here um, because it, it is important to understand sort of where the trout go during stressful times of year. Think peak summer in the middle of a drought like we had last year versus where they go um, during less stressful times, like in the spring. Um, and the way we did that is through uh, a really cool new technology called environmental DNA, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more in a minute. Um, so the dam and culvert assessment was the first component of this project. Um, what we did is we used what's called the NAACC method, the North Atlantic Aquatic Connectivity collaborative method um, to evaluate culverts for fish passage. So um, some of you are helping out with that project as volunteers, but basically what you do is you measure sort of key parameters about the, the pipes as well as the streams. Um, and then they have a formula that indicates whether that culvert is, is going to be a problem for fish passage or not. Um, so we assessed over 38 culverts and over 39, I'm sorry, over 80 culverts and over 39 dams um, in each of our cold water streams in the watershed. In addition to that, we uh, monitored temperature. 
So these little devices you see in the middle here, um, this is actually an older version of the one that we use, but they're called uh, Hobo Pendant Temperature Monitors. And they measure the water temperature and record it every 15 minutes. Um, and so you can really see how the temperature changes throughout the day and then throughout the months and the seasons. And we did that at uh, 34 different locations all throughout the watershed in each of the cold water streams. Um, and we did that April through October. And we use those data to compare uh, what is going on temperature wise with the, re the habitat requirements for brook trout and brown trout um, and really sort of evaluated stream health that way. And the last component of the study, which I thought was really cool um, and sort of a new technology is um, called eDNA or environmental DNA sampling. Um, this is a new method that's really come out in the past decade um, where you can collect a single uh, sample of water from a stream and you can detect the presence of any fish that you've developed a, a DNA fingerprint for or a very specific um, DNA sequence that's really specific to that type of fish. Um, so, and it doesn't need to be fish. It could be really any aquatic organism and, and people have also applied this to soils and look at terrestrial animals as well. It's, it's really cool, new promising technology. Um, but we really utilized it um, to detect brook trout and um, brown trout. And so the tests that we were using, um, the methods have been shown to be sensitive up to one kilometer. So what we did was basically break up each of the streams into one kilometer sections and collected a water sample at each kilometer and use that to assess whether there are trout present in that stretch upstream of where we collected the sample. And we used a really um, strict protocol to make sure we weren't cross-contaminating our samples. Um, but it was, it was really kind of fun to get out there and um, then to collect those samples. So in summary, uh, what we found was the vast majority of the culverts and road crossings um, in the watershed were somewhat restrictive, which means they may become an issue seasonally if water flows are very high or very low, um, but are generally passive. Fully crossable, um, about 17% were fully crossable. So if you think of like a, a bridge that has um, be, that's wider than the stream bed. So it's not having any sort of effect whatsoever. So about 17% of um, pipes were like that. And just under 10% of the culverts that we measured um, were actually not crossable or, or barriers for fish passage. Um, in our temperature study, we found that four out of our eight streams, so half of the streams contained sections that were still saying cold enough to support brook trout year round. So the water temperatures never crossed um, the maximum threshold for brook trout. Every stream had at least one section that was uh, cold enough to support brown trout. But the, it's important to note that a lot of the places where we placed these temperature loggers were placed um, sort of out of convenience for the access and for volunteers to be able to find them easily and go out to them once a month to download the data. So there may have been deeper pools that exist or there may have been you know sections with a lot of groundwater upwelling that we weren't detecting because of where we placed the the temperature monitors. So it's not to say that you know this is the definitive condition for the entire stream, but this is kind of a good sense of what's going on temperature wise in each of these streams. And Jenny's gonna talk a little bit more about that um, in next year's efforts as well. And then with the eDNA, we got some, uh, some unexpected results. Um, so 15 of the sites that we evaluated were positive for brook trout. So about a quarter of all of the sites that we tested. 
And none of the sites had brown trout, which was really kind of a strange result that we were not expecting at all. You know, most conceptually, most people think of brook trout as being more sensitive to things like temperature than brown trout are. Um, so we thought certainly the areas that are supporting brook trout must also be supporting brown trout. Um, but that's just not the case. And um, what was also interesting was we thought, oh, maybe there was something wrong with the, the fingerprint that we were using or the DNA sequence. Um, we, we partnered with a lab in University of Maine to do the actual genetic work. And we thought, oh, maybe that's the problem. So we actually went and tracked down a, a fin clipping from a brown trout at a local, um, local uh, fishery around here, a local hatchery, I mean, excuse me, um, which we assume it would be the source population for the brown trout that were stocked in the Neponset. And the fingerprint worked out perfectly and, and identified that fish tissue sample as being brown trout. So it sort of validates the fact that, you know, we did not detect any brown trout. That doesn't mean they're not there. They may be in very small levels or in areas where um, we weren't able to collect the sample, but really sort of a surprising result to not find brown trout. But the good news was more than half of the streams, so five out of the eight streams, actually had brook trout present. Um, but, you know, this is interesting to see in summary, but it's really um, more powerful and more interesting to look at it in this map form. So we've created this interactive map where you can see how the different um, layers and data pieces fit together geographically um, to really get a better uh, sense of what's going on and, and allows you to ask some really interesting questions about how some of these different factors are interacting with each other. Um, so let me see, hopefully this link will work. Are you guys still seeing my screen? Can you see the map? Excellent. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Awesome. So this is the map. You can find it on um, NEPRA's website if you just go to neponset.org, right in the blogs section, right on the front page, you'll see something that says, I believe trout map or something like that. Um, and you click on that link and it'll take you to this map. And so if you see here, you have each of the cold water streams. So each, this, this is the Neponset watershed, this shape here. And each of these are the small watersheds for each of the cold water streams. And you can find the names here. So you have Beaver Brook down here and Trap Hole Brook here, Brown in the middle. Um, and you can, see the results of the culverts. So these are all the culverts that we evaluated and they're sort of barrier class. Hey, Chris, um, I don't think we can see what you're seeing. Oh, you don't, see, do you see? We just see the static slide, I think right now. Okay, let me, let me get out and um, try this again. Sorry about that. No, that's fine. If it gave you a pop-up, you may have to share the pop-up window. Yeah, I think that's correct, yeah. There so, sorry. So this is the, the Neponset watershed, this shape here. And then each of these smaller colored shapes are the different cold water streams. And you can find their names down here so you can identify each one that you're looking at. Um, and then you have sort of this list of layers, which is really the data that we collected. Um, so this first one that I turned on is the culverts, color coded based on if they were uh, a moderate barrier or significant barrier. Um, so you can see sort of how the location of the barrier is really important. So say, you know, down here to have a culvert that's perched or the significant unpassable culvert means that fish aren't really coming up from the main stem and getting into this whole huge system here, that this system is sort of isolated in a way from that. Um, Versus here, you have a problem, but it's much further up in the watershed. So say these sections are being cut off, um, but the rest of the stream is accessible um, to, to fish that are coming through Willet Pond there. Um, so it lets you, looking at it sort of geographically, lets you um, sort of contextualize some of the, the results a little bit. Um, you can throw on, here's the layer uh, of dams that we evaluated. So, you know, while this culvert isn't great, there's a dam right downstream of it. 
So, you know, in, until that dam is resolved, that culvert's not really a problem. So when you're thinking about prioritizing actions, you know, you can take those sorts of things into consideration. Um, the dam layer is really cool too, and I'm hoping that we can keep updating it so you can see where we've removed dams. So some of you I know on the call, Gary was there in 2015. This is the, the dam that uh, GBTU and NEPRA removed um, in 2015 on Trap Hole Brook. And right after that dam was removed, we actually saw trout passing upstream and downstream through the sites, which was really kind of a cool result. Um, so you can explore sort of where the dams exist in the watershed. Um, on here we have fishery records from uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife. So you can actually see where they've surveyed and found trout. So in 1979, they surveyed there and found 47 brook trout. Um, you can see where we collected our eDNA samples and you can see where uh, we've monitored temperature. And one of the really interesting things is sort of these next sections. So you can see here the different sections of the streams that had brook trout present. Um, so you can see trap hole brook here. Everywhere we looked, there were brook trout, which isn't surprising at all. But right in this adjacent watershed, Beaver Brook, they were only in this little section right here. Um, you can also turn on the temperature results. So these dark, dark blue sections, these are uh, the coldest water. So this is prime brook trout habitat. Um, the lighter blue is areas that are a little bit warmer than brook trout would prefer, but are still cold enough for brown trout to support brown trout. And then these gray sections are really just getting too hot for any sort of trout at all. Um, but it's really sort of interesting, again, to look at sort of the intersections of these different layers and how they interact with each other, because you have a section like this that according to our temperature data is too hot, yet there were brook trout present. Um, or areas where you get a, a strong kind of confirmation that brook trout are present in this area that's staying cold, but everywhere else that's too hot, there's no trout at all. Um, so really sort of cool to dive into this, these layers and dive into the results. And that's really sort of what Jenny's about to talk about is what the next steps are and making sense of all of this and sort of prioritizing next actions. Um, and so I encourage everyone to uh, explore this website on their own. If you go to um, theponset.org, my internet will let me. Mike also put the uh, link in the chat. Oh, excellent, yeah. It's right here if you wanna find it, Native Trout Restoration Map. It's right here on the front page of naponset.org. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Jenny. Uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and she can fill you in on sort of what's the next steps and how do you make sense of all of this? Super, um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome. And um, can everybody see a slide that has a snowy brook in it and says what's next? Yes. Yep. Okay, in the right presentation mode? Yes, indeed. Super, great. Okay, so thanks, Chris. That was an awesome overview of the genesis of the project. Um, I didn't know some of that information, so it was great to hear you go through it. So hi, everyone. Um, I don't think I've met most of you. Um, uh, I'm new to NEPRA. I started just before the holidays. Um, and actually, um, as they said when they were giving my bio, um, I've done most of my professional career out in California. And so I'll use that as my um, get out of jail free card if I miss um, any of the brook names or um, say something silly. So Chris, feel free to um, jump in if needed. Um, so anyways, Chris just talked about the origin of the project and um, the awesome data that was collected last year. Really impressive amount of data actually to be collected in just one sampling season. So I'm gonna talk about um, what's next. So we're gonna do some more sampling in the springtime. So I wanna go over some of the plans that we have. 
um, some ways that we might analyze the data, and then some things that might go into the final report, which is due in September of 2021. So um, just under a year left for this project. And this was actually the first um, place that I went to when I uh, moved here and started working at NEFRA um, Tropical Brook right after that snowstorm. And I just thought, wow, this is really beautiful. So um, anyways, I'm glad to, glad to be a part of this project. So um, springtime sampling, and it's coming up faster, um, faster than we imagine. So uh, first, before I get into these bullet points that I realized based on Chris's um, talk when he was talking about seasonality is, I didn't even put that on here, but we definitely want to resample um, some of the eDNA in the sites that they did over the summer, because we are interested in um, if the fish populations are um, typically staying in the same areas throughout the year or if they are showing seasonal trends and maybe moving certain places during the stressful summertime temperatures um, and then taking advantage of the cooler spring temperatures and using different parts of the watershed. But what I really wanted to focus on for, um, for this talk were um, how we plan to kind of further investigate um, habitat suitability at sites with quote unquote curious findings and then how we want to continue document trout distribution within the Neponset River watershed. Um, so what do I mean by curious findings? So as I'm sure most of you know um, better than me, um, trout, like uh, brook trout, like most trout, prefer cold temperatures, right? Um, they're cold water species. Um, and so a curious finding might be an area that had very high temperatures over the summer, and yet there was a trout population present. And then similarly, a curious finding might be that um, there were cool summertime temperatures, right? So it might be considered a refuge habitat, and yet there were no trout populations present. So those are two places that we want to do some further investigation in of, um, this springtime. And then in addition to that, we want to continue to document the trout distribution. Um, so Chris mentioned that the focus of the summer sampling was really on the cold water streams. Um, but he also mentioned that um, you know, the main stem can be used as a corridor, right, for trout to get from one tributary to another, or one cold water stream to another. And so we're curious if they are using the main stem, right, and if they are traveling between tributaries. So we might want to add some sites in on the main stem. And then finally, um, some sites on the east branch of the Neponset River or tributaries in that area, where we really only looked at um, one stream in the east branch over the summer. So, Getting into this, so first, some of these curious findings. So what are our plans here? So areas that have high temperatures based on our monitoring, and yet there was, um, there was trout found based on the eDNA analysis. Now, when I say trout, I'm referring to brook trout, because as, um, as Chris mentioned, we actually didn't find any eDNA for brown trout. Doesn't mean they're not there, it just means we didn't find them. So in general, I'm referring to brook trout. Okay, curious finding number one high temperatures and trout present. So the main question that we have in these areas is given that we did monitor some pretty high temperatures, we wanna know if the fish are able to find refuge habitat in these areas. And when I say refuge habitat, I mean cold water areas, um, or if they're just stuck in these warm temperatures and they're stressed out for a, through the duration of the summer. So the example that I'm giving here is Poag Brook. Um, this was one of the sites right next to the confluence with the main stem. Um, and if I direct your attention to the, um, the graph at the bottom of the page, this is just the raw temperature time series that they monitored over the summer. So we have temperature in degrees Celsius on the y-axis, and we have time um, on the x-axis, and then we have all of our temperature results in the lines. Um, and then I put a big red horizontal line at 20 degrees Celsius because that's about the temperature that starts becoming stressful for brook trout. So any temperatures above 20 degrees Celsius are going to start getting a little stressful. Um, and you can see some of the statistics up top. The maximum temperatures um, were even approaching 26 degrees Celsius. So super stressful for these species. Um, and impressively, the spent above 20 degrees Celsius was 431 hours. So about half of this time that we monitor temperature, um, these fish were experiencing stressful conditions. And so we want to know, well, why, why did we find um, such a strong signal of trout in this area? And we want to know, given that there are so many trout here, 
um, were they able to find refuge? And they could find refuge if there's two things, right? If there's lateral connectivity and longitudinal connectivity. So I just wanted to find those two terms um, before I move on. So lateral connectivity, and um, let me just say, you guys would not believe how long I spent of my Saturday making this slide and trying to build a little um, out of the various icons and shapes on PowerPoint. Um, lots of my Saturday went to this. So anyways, I really appreciate my willow and my um, cattail marsh. Um, so anyways, um, lateral connectivity means that um, the main channel is connected to the floodplain, is connected to the side waters and the back waters and the edge waters. So for example, if the fish are hanging out here and summer rolls in and it starts heating up, they're able to move from um, that stressful area to a, um, a lateral position in the stream. Um, on the contrary, longitudinal connectivity is a little different. By the time I got to this slide, I was um, tired of PowerPoint, so it's a lot simpler. I didn't make it as beautiful. Um, but longitudinal connectivity, as opposed to referring to the cross section of the stream, actually refers to the connection headwaters to estuary. So can the fish move up and down stream? So again, if the fish are hanging out here and it starts heating up, are they able to move downstream? And in general, they would be, unless of course, like Chris mentioned, there's a barrier. So if there's a dam or a culvert, or, or a natural barrier also. So, um, you know, a steep, a steep step pool or waterfall or whatever. So anyways, back to this slide. So what we wanna do in the springtime is look at the lateral connectivity and the longitudinal connectivity and do some additional analysis. So we wanna see um, laterally across the stream, are there different habitats that have different temperature variations? Um, so even if where the temperature logger was, was in a particularly warm area, Maybe nearby, like Chris was mentioning, there is a lot of cold water upwelling um, or a very shaded area that could be a refuge. And then maybe they're able to move longitudinally. And so we'd want to do a microhabitat analysis um, above and below significant barriers to see if the fish are able to find refuge elsewhere. Okay, so that was our um, habitat suitability at sites with curious findings for the high temperatures. So now we are curious about um, sites where there were cool temperatures and yet no trout population present. So um, in this area, same, same sorts of um, figures on the slide, a different um, site though, so the data is a little bit different. So now you can see um, with our temperature time series that throughout the duration of the um, temperature monitoring, um, for the most part, it stayed below two degrees Celsius. So um, in general, the temperature was not passing over that um, thermally stressful threshold. Um, maximum temperatures were just about 22 degrees Celsius compared to the almost 26 degrees Celsius at that last site. And most impressively, the time above this threshold of 20 degrees Celsius was only 19 hours. Um, and that's throughout the entire summer. Whereas at that previous site, remember, we had over 400 hours of stressful temperatures just in the month and a half where they were doing the monitoring. Um, so in general, this looks like it would be a thermally suitable um, site for brook trout. Um, and yet, based on the EDMA analysis, um, we didn't find any. Again, it doesn't mean that they're not there, but um, we didn't, we didn't um, sense any. And so what we might want to do here is a barrier analysis from the nearest population. Um, so we could use the dam and culvert surveys um, that were done and try and figure out maybe the issue is brook trout just aren't able to repopulate this area. Um, but we'd also want to look at other stressors, right, and try to figure out why they aren't here. So if it's not um, a barrier, and if it's not a temperature issue, possibly it's a habitat issue. So um, maybe there's not, you know, uh, gravelly riffles that they need to spawn or deep pools. It could also be a hydrologic issue, right? So maybe there's not enough water at the right times, or there's too much water at the wrong times. Um, so different things that we want to look into. It could be water quality, and it could be biotic stresses, right? So there could be, you know, maybe there is not a lot of cover and there's aerial predation, um, competition, et cetera. Um, so these are other things that we want to look into um, this springtime. And one interesting thing to kind of keep in the back of our mind at these sites that do have um, cool temperatures throughout the summer, for whatever reason, like it could be lots of groundwater upwelling or lots of shading or whatever. 
um, their potential sites for stream translocations um, in the future. So if we think ahead, thinking about climate change and some of these other sites that are getting very hot, if they continue to get hotter, um, they might become too hot for the brook trout, right? And then we might want to move some populations and um, this could be a refuge area that we um, kind of keep in our back pockets as a place where um, we, could, um, we could seed a population. So those are our curious findings. So next what we want to do this springtime is continue to document trout distributions. So we talked a little bit about um, eDNA sampling on the main stem and then doing some eDNA sampling on the east branch of the Neponset River or some of the tributaries. So starting with the main stem. So um, what you're looking at here, you guys all probably know this much better than me, is um, an outline of the Neponset River watershed. All the blue lines are the streams and anywhere you see a dot is where they did eDNA sampling um, over the summer. Okay, so a black dot, the small black dots mean no signals found. This doesn't mean that the trout aren't there. It just means that um, we, didn't, we didn't capture any eDNA in our samples. And the bigger and the redder the dots get, the stronger the signal, which essentially means either the population is larger or the fish were closer or the fish are bigger. For whatever reason, there was a lot of DNA in their sample and they were able to sense that um, when they did their eDNA assays up at UMaine. Okay, and so I want to zoom into this dot in the middle. Um, Chris, I think he talked about this one, but this is um, a strong signal at Ponkapoa Brook. Um, interestingly, this was actually the first example I used as the site with high temperatures and yet a large population found. Um, and it's kind of an interesting site because it's right at the confluence. And so it first makes us wonder, you know, if the trout are so close to the confluence, are they um, using the main stem as a corridor to get to other areas, particularly because based on the eDNA signals moving up the stream, except for this one site here, um, we didn't have much signal moving up the stream. And so we might wonder, are these fish also using the main stem? Um, and this would be a means, I think I mentioned this earlier, as a way for trout to get from one area um, to another. So for example, this trout population on Ponkapoa Brook could migrate up and get to another cold water tributary um, elsewhere, elsewhere further up the stream. So we want to do some sampling along the main stem to see if trout are able to use it as a corridor. And just because they're on the main stem doesn't necessarily mean the main stem has to support all of their life history phases. Like they don't necessarily have to spawn in the main stem, just a question of if they're able to use it for migration. Okay, so and next, um, same, um, same map, but I've moved my little box uh, to be lower in the watershed. So we're curious about doing some additional sampling on the east branch of the Neponset River. So over the summer, um, we looked just at this one tributary, Beaver Brook. Um, and you can see a lot of black dots, which means we didn't find much of an eDNA signal um, going up until the very tippy top of the um, watershed where we found a weak signal. Um, but just because it's a weak signal, it just means that someone's there, right? So there's brook trout present. And so it kind of makes us wonder, what about the rest of the tributaries? So I'm gonna zoom in on that site. So this is still Beaver Brook, right? We still have our black dots. As we go up, we didn't find any eDNA signals. And here's our weak signal at the very tippity top of the tributary. And now I've added in where we did the temperature monitoring. And so interestingly, temperature monitoring was done right next to the location where that eDNA sample um, was taken. And so this corresponds to the top graph where we have our same temperature time series with our same 20 degree threshold. And you can see at this site, temperatures stay well below 20 degrees Celsius. And so it makes sense that um, the fish might be there because it was a thermally suitable area. But interestingly, as you go down the stream, and we didn't see any eDNA signals, and we look at the other three um, temperature monitoring results, we see the temperatures far surpass the 20 degree threshold. And um, in fact, they even approach 30 degrees Celsius, um, which is much too hot for brook trout. Um, and so we might wonder, even though some of the other tributaries in this 
might not be designated as cold water streams um, or trout streams, they might have some similar patterns where there's a few areas that are cold enough to support brook trout and we wanna do some further um, sampling in these areas to determine uh, if in fact there are some populations elsewhere. Hey, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Andre, just um, yeah. can, Chris or, or Jennifer, can you remind us when the DNA samples were taken? just in relative to those temperature graphs? I think they were in July, right, Chris? August. August, August right? Yeah. Okay. So so just uh, the reason I asked is it just, it seems like there may have been a mortality, there could have been a mortality event associated with those temperatures, right? Around the time that we took those samples. Just curious, uh, just if that is true. Yeah. It might be true, yeah. That's definitely possible. So um, eDNA, um, it's a great technology for surveying, but it's not perfect. And so if you get your timing off, you know, the fish um, moved on or they died off, you know, earlier, then you wouldn't pick up the signal. Um, similarly, if they're too far away from where you sample, then you wouldn't pick up the signal. Um, so definitely um, a negative eDNA result does not mean that the fish aren't there. It doesn't mean that the fish were never there. It, all it really means is that um, they didn't pick up the eDNA signal in the sample that you sent them in the lab. Um, so definitely, there could be all kinds of reasons. Good point. Um, okay, so what's next? Um, so that, so what I just went over is what's next for um, sampling in the springtime. And then of course, we have to put together um, some ideas for restoration projects. Um, so restoration projects, some of the obvious ones include barrier removals, like Chris mentioned, um, shading, riparian area restoration, essentially making habitat more suitable and increasing the connectivity. Um, we also might want to put together future studies, like I talked about earlier. So if it's not a barrier issue, um, and if it's not a water temperature issue, um, could it be water quality? In which case we might want to start thinking about stormwater, um, could biotic interactions be the issue, an invasive from predators or predation? And then is it um, hydrologic impairment? So is there enough water at the right time? And um, of course, this last one is going to be a bigger and bigger question as our precipitation regimes continue to change over the years. So some great Embrace the Stream outcomes that are really exciting. Um, of course, this means GB2 members and NEPRA staff get to have lots more opportunities to collaborate on fun projects in the future, but essentially we want to put together a laundry list of things that we can do over the years. Um, there might be some great things if brook trout distributions lead to additional stream protections. And then finally, um, what we all really care about is ecological implications if we reduce stressors to enhance the resiliency of our native trout towards the changing climate. Um, and then, the last goal I wanted to mention is that what's so great about trout, um, not just brook trout, but all trout, is they really use all of the stream throughout their life history phases. And so if you improve stream health um, for a trout, you're really improving stream health for all in stream communities. So um, all the little critters win. So definitely get involved. Um, we're gonna need a lot of help this springtime. I know with COVID it's a little um, hard, but outdoors, everyone wears masks. You saw from some of the pictures last year. Um, so some of the, um, the tasks that we'll be doing this springtime are the same as last year. So deploying temperature loggers, um, collecting samples for eDNA testing. And then we'll be doing some different kinds of field work, like some surveys of hydraulic habitat and some surveys of um, stream temperature. Uh, thank you once again. I know Chris showed this slide earlier to all the volunteers who helped last year. Um, this was all before I got here, so um, everyone um, really did much more of this project than I did. I'm just here talking about it. Um, thanks to the people at University of Maine for their DNA analysis, and then of course all the donors. And that is all that I have. So here's our contact information, and I think I'm gonna pass the posting back to someone. <laughs> And um, definitely type in questions or ask any questions that you guys have. We have plenty of time. Yeah, Jennifer and Chris, we will um, 
when you give us sort of the heads up on volunteer dates and opportunities, we'll make sure we publish that on uh, the GBTU social media. And I'm sure Nancy, I see you're on board. You'll probably do the same with NEPRA also. So uh, stay tuned for timing for some of those volunteer opportunities. And by the way, really great presentation by both of you, really thorough. It's great to see where the money and the volunteer hours went and uh, the curious finds will uh, be some of the detective work that you have to do. Yeah, let me echo what Ruiz and uh, Chris and Jennifer, that was just an outstanding presentation. And uh, for those of us who were there in the beginning, uh, this is so gratifying to see uh, that this Embrace the Stream has yielded such you know, superb results. And I think a lot of us are looking forward to when we can get out again as a group and, and join you in doing some of the field work. I did have a question though. Um, on the stream where you showed the um, presence of brook trout only at the um, you know, headwater section is, you know, when you mentioned the timing of it was August, I could imagine that if you did the eDNA analysis in let's say May, when those downstream segments of the stream would be colder, you might see that it's populated throughout. And then as it gets warmer, those trout are pretty good at uh, moving upstream until they find the suitable you know, temperature habitat. So I was just thinking a really nice thing to do this year would be to make sure you do the eDNA analysis in a different um, you know, time domain, do it early in the spring, or maybe even again later in the fall when the temperature goes back to a much cooler level. But um, boy, it just prompts so many questions and opportunities. So thank you again. I'm, I'm so glad I got a chance to see this. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. So um, like uh, Chris mentioned, they did the eDNA sampling in August. So the idea was, let's see what the distribution looks like during very stressful times. Um, so the next time that we're planning to go out is the early springtime. So um, late March, April, uh, maybe early May. Um, and see how the seasonality affects the distribution of the brook trout. Yeah, it was a pretty brutal yeah, August, happening. if we remember. It was pretty dry. <laughs> yes, very dry. <laughs> we tried to take yes. some samples out of mud instead of water. So, yeah, <laughs> it was tough. Yes, I, I'd just like to add to, to what was said. Uh, I thought it was a great presentation, both Chris and Jenny. And um, my daughter and I, uh, we were sort of super involved in, in doing data collection, the temperature monitoring and the, and the uh, eDNA sampling. And it was, it was actually great to just, uh, just get out of the house occasionally. That was, I think the, the second time we went out to collect the data temperature, data, data temperature uh, data. My daughter said it was the first time in that month, in a month that she'd been out of the house in the car. <laughs> so, so um, but also, um, interested in that you, you showed the, the data from Tubrake Brook, which is actually where we uh, collected the, the, the temperature data. And uh, that I, I, was, I was sort of hoping that, that we would uh, uh, detect uh, brook trout there because it, you know, it just did stay amazingly cold the whole, whole summer. Uh, but also maybe not, not super surprised because it was such a piece of skinny water. Um, we went, um, after we we realized that you know further downstream was getting getting very warm and, and but that little point on Tubrek Brook was staying cold we went to, sort of to see if we could scout out where the source of the water was and the, where the cold water was coming from and so you know initially we said well let's go to the source because it looked like it was flowing out of a, a little pond and we found the pond and, and then we sort of tried to find where the water came out and eventually found the stream further down with the culvert and it was completely dry and you know there was no water and then we went further downstream and then there was no water and and eventually we you know we sort of narrowed down we found one road crossing where there was water just upstream from where the temperature monitor was but but the distance from there to the next temperature monitor you know downstream where it was warm water was was you know, only a, about a mile or so. And, and that actually goes right through a big, big wetland um, where, where I think, the, you know, the water gets very warm. It, there's a place called the Fort Factory Brook Reservation, which 
which I, we didn't actually go and scout out, but I assume there's a barrier there because it's the site of an old mill. Uh, so there's all, almost certainly uh, a barrier there. And I don't know how difficult it is to remove barriers when they're, you know, historic uh, significance like that. Presumably that's very difficult to remove a barrier like that. Um, but uh, it's, it's uh, great to see how, how it's all connected together and how the, you know, the, the culverts and the, the, the lack of water and the, the DNA sampling, it all ties together. So it's really good. We had a lot of fun participating too. Yeah, I was really happy to have you guys. You were one of the more reliable kind of excited volunteers. So that was great. Thank you so much for, for helping. And yeah, I think looking at flow would be a really interesting parameter as well because that system in general, Mill Mine, Brook, Tubrek has a lot of municipal water withdrawals from the, the local towns. And so it's not uncommon for parts of that brook, like you said, to go completely dry, especially in the summer as people are, you know, watering their lawns and golf courses are in operation. And, you know, there's so many different demands for water on the landscape. Right, where, where that temperature monitor was on Tubrek Brook, the flow is remarkably constant. And for each month we went back in the summer, we were kind of wondering, is, it gonna, is there gonna be water flowing? And, and you know, amazingly that it was pretty much the same every week. So it's coming from somewhere, you know, some spring somewhere, I think. Hey, Chris, I have another question for you. Um, given all of this fine work, have you considered engaging the state of Massachusetts to do um, some electroshocking in those brooks where you have found trout to get some sizing information and um, population density? Yes, yeah, so we, um, we've we been working with Adam Kautza with the state um, and he's agreed. We were more interested in some of the smaller tributaries that don't have um, current cold water designation to basically have them formally document that, um, the presence. But we didn't talk specifically about having them document size or um, population density, but that would be an interesting follow-up. And I, I bet they would be interested in that as well. We've, yeah, been share, we've been sharing the temperature data with them and sharing the eDNA data with them. And yeah, they're very interested in this project. Great. I'm gonna check the chat if there were any questions in there. I didn't see any. Um... There's a few yeah. comments. It's a yeah, pretty small um, and no one seems to be too shy, but if you do have any questions, I don't know, does anyone from uh, NEPRA uh, other than uh, Jennifer ha have any comments that you wanna make from your organization's point of view? Go ahead, Rory, just pull off mute. Yep. Now I was going to say that the uh, the Beaver Brook location that you were looking at, uh, the part that has the I guess presence of trout is really the headwater uh, of Beaver Brook, and it comes right off of Moose Hill, which is the Moose Hill Sanctuary in Sharon, and uh, the rest of Beaver Brook where we didn't see the trout. Uh, it runs right along the train track, the I-95, I'm sorry, the uh, Providence to Boston main rail line, and that section of Beaver Brook has very little uh, foliage covering it. It's very exposed to the sunshine, and I can see why that would be a location where, where trout would not be too happy to live, certainly in the summertime, um, perhaps in the earlier part of the year. Uh, and it is interesting, the temperature graph showed very clearly what happens to that section of Beaver Brook um, in the summer months. So I'm not surprised, uh, but it is interesting that that very short section of the headwater would actually have trout in it. And how did they get there? I guess they must have gotten there a long time ago. And Declan was with me when we surveyed that whole section of Beaver Brook. Um, and we could see very clearly that that was a lush, a lush area to be a trout. Uh, but once you get through that culvert and start heading downstream, it's not a place I would want to be. It's just too hot. Yeah, that area up there is fascinating. Just the landscape is so strange. There's these rolling hills and then 
pools of, of that are just freshwater springs essentially. Um, it's a really cool area. I recommend anybody who's interested in sort of geology and and springs to go check that region out because it's it's wild. But I don't go into the uh, the cedar swamp. Declan and can attest that we collected a couple of the more remote samples that we thought that volunteers wouldn't be uh, interested in getting. And that was probably the most intense hiking I've ever done in my life. It was insane. And I lived in Costa Rica for a year chasing monkeys. So I, I know jungles and this was beyond anything I've experienced. Hey, Chris, um, Tom, uh... Palmer has a comment that he said state shocking happened in Pine Tree Brook a few years ago. So did, did that just show, um, did that show any of the brown trout or do you remember what the results were? I think it was just brook trout, but don't quote me on that. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that was in 2015. Um, they went in shock because I guess we knew there were brook trout there, but the state was never able to find them. And um, as I understand it, this was before I was at NEPRA, but from what I understand, uh, we basically walked them to the spot and said, shock right here, this is where the trout are. And lo and behold, they found a whole bunch, all age classes too, which is really cool. So that's a sign that they're reproducing there. Very nice. Do they still stock Pine Tree Brook? What is that doing to the name? They do still stock Pine Tree Brook. Um, <clears throat> they stock it at the um, the location right at the, the flood control dam. I'm not sure what impact that's having on the native population. Do you know what they stock it with? Is it just browns or do they stock it with brook trout too? Brook trout is as far as I'm aware. Yeah. I've, I've caught brook trout in that, uh, in that, like flood plain area. I've caught stock brook trout there, but right before that I've seen native brook trout. So it was just interesting. Yeah, that's that's a whole can of worms that I don't know if we want to dive into right now, but yeah. Um, I, I don't know if there's any sort of impacts. And yes, Tom did photograph a brown trout on the main stem, which I was hoping we were gonna find brown trout, a signal of them this time around. Um, because if you look at the temperatures on Pine Tree Brook, pretty much everything except Pope's Pond is cool enough to support brown trout. Um, and it's sort of a dream of mine if you could remove the, the Baker Dam and you could open up Pope's Pond, you could essentially create a condition where you could have sea run brook trout out of the Neponset, which would be insane. Um, there's a lot of, of what have to happen in that, but oh, yeah. we can dream. You get Steve excited. <laughs> so uh, we're a little bit past uh, eight o'clock. I don't know, any closing comments or thoughts or otherwise a uh, fantastic uh, presentation. Looking forward to the volunteer opportunities for NEPRA and GBTU to work side by side in the stream again. And um, Chris, congrats on your new role and continuing to support um, this Embrace the Stream project. And Jennifer, welcome back to the East Coast and, and joining uh, NEPRA and all the work that you're going to do with us over the years. Yeah, great presentation. Thank you. Yeah, great job, guys. So there was Thank one you. correction that we wanted to make from uh, earlier. I don't know whether you could uh, see my slides here. We uh, unfortunately left Andre off the, the uh, board, <laughs> the slide with the board. So my apology, apologies to you, Andre. I was trying to- No worries. Trying to uh, snag a, a picture of you, uh, <laughs> but, you, but you had that bird up the whole time. So <laughs> I didn't get a chance to post your photo in here to add it, but my apologize, my apologies leaving you off there. Thank you, Mike. Not at all. Thank my, you. my miss and not seeing that in there. But, Cheers, Chris. Yeah. So, wait, wait. No worries. It's a team effort, not just the board, but all the members. And, and uh, again, looking forward to more cross 
organization uh, opportunities to uh, advance the protection of these great streams. And everyone be safe and feel free to see us next month. If you didn't vote on the, um, the Tim Flagler presentation, I'm gonna put that in the chat one more time. <clears throat> uh, I think we have four or five opportunities that Tim Flagler will come in in our March meeting. So if you pick one of those and that becomes the highest vote, uh, we're gonna close the voting on um, the 31st or something like that, right, Mike? Yep, that's right. Yeah. All right, everyone, be well, stay okay. safe. Thanks, guys. Thanks, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.